Welcome once again to Building Bridges with Greg Johnson. I'm your host, Greg Johnson, and we're so glad you can join us for another edition of our monthly podcast. Um, we're so excited about the growing audience we're developing and the connections. So by all means, if you like what you're seeing, uh, check it out, share it with others, uh, like it, and share and subscribe, of course. Uh, we're very appreciative. Today we have a very, very special podcast that we're going to share with you because uh, we're coming to you live from a place called Hilldale, Utah, uh, just across the uh, Arizona state line from Colorado City. fundamentalist Mormonism has thrived for over a hundred years and uh, over the last five years in particular something new has emerged here it's called the Dream Center out of uh, the Dream Center movement which is worldwide uh, out of a Phoenix Dream Center in Phoenix Arizona this Dream Center has come to be so we're gonna be meeting with the directors uh, uh, Glenn and Jenna Jones, who have been here with the Dream Center, opened it up here five years ago. We're going to get to know their story. We're going to get to know about what God is doing in this unique place today. And we're going to learn a lot. And I think you're going to be absolutely fascinated. I think most people are pretty intrigued with that whole polygamy question that uh, still uh, surrounds the Mormon story, uh, even though the Utah Mormon Church abandoned polygamy officially in 1890 uh, in something called the Manifesto. It proliferated beyond that time period uh, in, in Utah and then became uh, segmented into pockets of people who did not want to abandon the practice and different uh, offshoots of Mormonism. Utah Mormonism began and developed and have continued to this very day probably are familiar with the names of people like Warren Jeffs of the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the FLDS. So we're going to just uh, have an opportunity to, to hear firsthand about some amazing things that are happening. So I want to introduce our friends, Glenn and uh, Jenna Jones. Uh, those are your real names. That's us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not incognito. No. Yes. These are not, uh, you know, secret names or protective names, whatever. Uh, but you guys are the directors of the Dream Center. So maybe what I could ask both of you to do, and we'll do this very conversationally, uh, you know, kind of uh, tell us about this place. Tell us about the Dream Center, but also tell us a little bit about Colorado City and Hilldale and the Crick, as it's called. Or is it? Yep, the, the Crick. The right. Crick, not the Creek, but the Crick. The crick. Yeah. You got to get it right. Uh, you got to get yeah, it right. They'll know whether you're not out of town or not. Yeah, yeah. I can say it. So let's <clears throat> let's begin a little bit with the just the geography of this place. What what is this place? What is it all about? Both of us. Sure, sure. sure. So um, so they call it. It's the community is originally called Short Creek. Okay. Uh, and that's the towns of Colorado City and Hilldale. Hilldale being Utah, Colorado City being Arizona. Um, so, the, and the Crick is because there's literally a Crick that runs right through the middle of town that's called Short Creek. So that's where, where the, the, the name started. Um, Hilldale and Colorado City only came to be um, many years later after there was a raid here from, from Arizona. Um, and they wanted to change the name and kind of hide the, that, that what had happened here, uh, the raid for polygamy. So, okay. And that, that, that's a famous event that happened in 1953, correct? Correct. Yeah, the raid of 53. Yeah. And so up until that time, it, this whole community was called Short Creek. Short Creek. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then that's where these names... So, what was the what was the point of having literally a city on a state line? Was there any significance to that? So the you know obviously it works very well because if Utah was to raid them, they could go to Arizona, or if Arizona was to raid them, they go to Utah, and that's exactly what happened in 1953. <clears throat> they were kind of tipped off to the raid ahead of time, so they knew that uh, the governor had announced it on the radio that they were coming up. Um, so they had lookouts looking for the, the, the police cars coming in that day. Um, and it's actually kind of a, a great story as they set off dynamite on one of the hills. As the cars, as the police cars were coming into town that, that morning, very early in the morning, woke everybody up in town. And they still celebrate that today. On 4th of July, we set off some, some pretty big explosions really early in the morning to wake up everybody for the town for the, for, for the 4th of July. So, you know, when, that, when those bombs went off, and the dynamite went off, everybody went down into the center of town to the schoolhouse and met all the incoming police cars and, and officials that day. So it wasn't that they, it, that they ran to the other state necessarily, or did they? No, well, so 
Um, I'm not an exact expert on it, but I can say that, I, you know, just that from some of the stories, and these are firsthand stories that I've, I've heard from people that actually lived through it, yeah. is, um, you know, once they started arresting the men, then the leader at that time, uh, a guy named uh, Leroy Johnson, he was the prophet, okay. he started sending men across the creek, which is basically the, the, the kind of uh, the de facto border, that's yeah, the state line, to get back on the north side, get on the on the Utah side, okay. um, and not be over here so you potentially get arrested, because somebody needed help take care of some of the women and children and the people on the Utah side. So this community goes far. Goes how far back? When were when were the, when was this area begin beginning to exist? So it happened about the turn of the century, uh, about the same time as the Utah um, Manifesto, okay. um, which was the denouncing of the practice of polygamy. Um, they wanted to be still part of Utah, but they wanted to be as far away from Salt Lake City as, as possible. And literally, you know, for our building, the, the the Utah Arizona border is just literally stones throw away. Yeah. Yeah, I think people are fascinated, you know, even though there are many programs leaving polygamy, uh, various 2020 episodes and things about modern day polygamy, even even the uh, Sister Wives program and uh, the, 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 what's the one about the Christian, uh, the non-LDS uh, uh, connected, isn't there a... Uh, there's, program. You know, there's an HBO series called Big Love. There Big was Love, okay. kind of based on, loosely yeah. on this community. Yeah. So, so all these things that people still are intrigued by, amazed by, wondering how does this, how does this practice still uh, exist in America today, and all of these kind of questions. But this, this was really a religious-based community that believed it was essential to live this way, and that when the Utah Mormon Church denounced it and moved away from it, they felt that they were falling into error. Right. And that they were going to maintain this practice as a purity uh, of of the original revelations that they believe came through Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. So right. they were going to maintain it, whether or not the law disavowed it or not. Yep. Correct. The fundamentals of Mormonism. Yeah. There you go. That's okay. So and then it exists pretty much in this out of the way part of the world down here and in other pockets like in Mexico and other places around yeah. uh, in, in smaller communities where they could kind of be either unobserved. Or practice in anonymity, or in some way, you know, just stay under the radar as much as possible. Yep. And even to this day, here in Utah, uh, there are there are known polygamous groups like the Kingston Group up in northern Utah, or the Apostolic Brethren, which is another community. And there's multiple ones. I mean, FLDS is only one of I don't even know how many, but a number of sure. polygamous groups that exist under unique leadership, different prophets, different leaders, and they. They all emerge for one reason or another, but these things still exist right here. And as some of our, our viewers uh, of this podcast might note, um, just this year, it was a national news story. The legislature of the state of Utah decriminalized uh, the mm -hmm. practice of polygamy for the first time ever um, in light of the fact that, you know, the laws of the lands have changed about how to define marriage and other other issues that they think were, were important to do that. So, um, so. Tell us about what, what's been going on, what was going on in this area more recently before Warren Jeffs was put in prison. What was this place like in more recent times? Um, so before Warren took uh, power as the prophet, um, his father was the prophet, a gentleman named Rulon Jeffs. Um, they came down, they, Rulon and his family lived up in Salt Lake City. Um, I believe it was Cottonwood Canyon area. Um, and they came down to, uh, to, to the Short Creek area at about the, the, um, when the, when the, uh, the Olympics were going to happen in Salt Lake City. Okay. Um, they believed that potentially there was going to be the destructions or the end of the world at, at the turn of the century there from you know, 1999 to 2000. And so they were all going to come down here. So they moved all completely down here and, and set up a, a place here. This house was built. Um, a little bit before that time. Um, okay. So that was really when the, the, the Laker group or the group from Salt Lake City moved down here. But there was already a, a, quite a large, substantial group of, fun, a group of fundamentalists in, in this community. And that was run by uh, a gentleman. Um, so it was Rulon, um, Rulon Jeffs was the prophet, and then they would have a bishop in the community, and his name was Uncle Fred, or Fred, Fred Jessup. Okay. And... What was life like here, particularly under Warren Jeffs? Was it just n normal fundamentalist Mormonism, or did Warren Jeffs take it in a in a direction that made it much more scary, much more dangerous, much more, or or or, or not? Yeah, you, know, you almost have to to understand what happened with Warren. You have to back up a little bit and, re and recognize that when his father was here and controlling the community, and even before his father, and even before they moved down, it, it was. Um, 
you know, I, I call it, sometimes I'll call it a utopia. It, it was just a, a really amazing example of Americana, of a, of a, a very, um, I, I, I use the word socialist system because that's what it, it appeared to be. Um, you know, the, the, the streets, while they were dirt roads, there was a great park that was here. There was a zoo that was here. There was a medical center that was here. Uh, cemeteries, homes, um, and a tremendously large uh, meeting house that was built here. So they, they had this very uh, high sense of community and everybody pitched in, everybody did their fair share um, and sometimes more so. And so, you know, if your neighbor needed electrical work on their house and you were an electrician, you would go over and, and do that work and vice versa. If your neighbor was a plumber and you needed plumbing work on your house, he'd come over and do work on, on your house. You know, there's a, there's a great video um, where they built a house in a day. Hmm. And they brought all the people from the town and built. So you see this just tremendous camaraderie and sense of community. Um, and, and um, you know, many, many of my friends in this community all talk about how great it was to grow up here as a child. Very, very safe. You do community bike rides to the town, things like that. So, so to understand that that was what was here. And then as Rulon became sick, he had a stroke. Um, so he became less and less of a, of a verbal ruler. Uh, Ro uh, then Warren would start taking control. Right. Um, and I think as Warren got more and more power, I think absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, and that's really what happened. Yeah. Is bit by bit, step by step, he started taking it to new levels of um, the community crazy. community wasn't used to seeing. Yeah, yeah definitely the community yeah. was not used to seeing. And I think that's helpful for people to understand that there is, even for things that we're not familiar with or we don't understand or we think that are different or bad or wrong, um, to, to even think of, of this polygamous community as operating with some level of utopianism mm -hmm. or idealism, that it was all a, a wonderful community, that it meant something to them, that they were true believers. They're not hostages, uh, if you will. They don't at least mm -hmm. perceive themselves as hostage. And then I think, you know, that, that what I think I know or, you know, what the common understanding is, is that there was really kind of an authoritarian increase and and some of the troubling issues with marrying off younger girls and behaviors that related to basically sexual trafficking and some of those kinds of issues that were taking place with which eventually caught up with Warren Jeffs and he of course is in prison to this day for those accusations and uh, and being tried for those behaviors so 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 how did how did life after Warren Jeffs was eventually tried and put in prison and has been there since about 2002, how has life in Colorado City and Hilldale changed? Are there, is, is there, is there anything that's happened as a result of that? Yeah, you know, I mean, we're seeing so literally much. history in the making right <laughs> yeah. here. I mean, it's, it's, um, we take up your whole podcast trying to <laughs> explain it. Um, you know, you've seen, I would say that this religion or this cult um, is crumbling. Um, is falling apart bit, bit by bit. I mean, there's obviously still a, 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 a substantial amount of FLDS through to true to, to Warren Jeffs and the true to that prophet. But more and more on a kind of on a regular basis, it's a landslide of people that are leaving that, that, that religion. Um, I think they've recognized that he is not getting out of prison because that was what he keeps you know, predicting is one day he's going to get out of prison and he'll come back to be with And them. they would be nervous if he, did, if he did come back and they weren't uh, in a faithful... Sure. Uh, you know, yeah. believing place, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, we always say that there's really, there's four types of people in this community. There's us, which are the Gentiles that have kind of moved in. And that's a very small number. Okay. It's increasing slightly. But, you know, when we first got here, um, you know, I would say there was less than 20 of us that were in this community. Uh, then you have the true blue, loyal to Warren Jeffs, FLDS. So that you'd still see the ladies in the prairie dress with the very elaborate hairdos in the back. Um, men would wear long sleeves uh, all the way down to their wrists, uh, often tucked in, baseball cap and jeans. Um, so you see the, the true loyal FLDS. Um, and then the majority of what this community is now, and, it, and it's changed. I think when we first arrived here, there was more FLDS than there was what we would call apostates now. Okay. And, and apostates are people who have been kicked out or left of their own accord from the FLDS, FLDS religion. But still live in this they area. They still live in this community. Yeah. You yeah. know, people, people wonder why, why on earth would you stay here? Now, look, there's a, there is a tremendous amount of population that has moved, but the majority of the community has stayed here because it's their hometown. 
town. They remember it as a good place. They remember it as a place where they grew up and, and, and great things happened. Um, their fathers were here. Sometimes even their great grandfathers and things like that were here. So, so they want to stay here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so then, so you have the apostates, which is now the majority of the community is okay. now apostates uh, by far the, the majority. I would say. How many probably, people would you say live in the in the area? So I think the last census was about eight thousand. Is that right? Yeah, so it's it's actually uh, Hilldale's a little bit smaller. Okay. So Hilldale's about twenty five hundred was the last census, and then Colorado City is about fifty five hundred, uh, okay. somewhere around there. So that's so about eight thousand yeah, total. Yeah, it's about eight thousand total for Short Creek community. And would you say that um, up to you know how how many would be apostate? How many would be loyal FLDS people? So the number yeah. for loyal FLDS is changing consistently, yeah. okay. uh, constantly. So, um, you know, I, I would say that um, now it's maybe 1,500, 1,800. If, if, shrinking yeah, day shrinking, by day. Yeah. 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 A lot of them have moved away. So they've moved to other compounds or other, other areas. So they've moved to St. George. They've moved, a lot have moved to Cedar City. Uh, they've moved to Wyoming. They've moved to um, uh, Minkos, Colorado, Minkos, Colorado um, Canada, Mexico. Um, okay. You know, they've, 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 there's yeah. other places where the FLDS had, had, had facilities. And so yeah, they, yeah, they moved to, yeah. There's, a, there's quite a large... Uh, grouping in Cedar City and in St. George now, though. Interesting. Okay. Well, okay, so, so, you know, we can't spend all of our time talking about the community and, and the FLDS religion per se, because we really have a bigger story to tell. So I was wondering, uh, Jenna, can you begin to tell us a little bit about how this thing called the Dream Center came <laughs> to Hilldale, Utah? Where, where does that vision start? How does it actually begin to take root, and how did you guys get connected in that? So the, the Dream Center is part of a network of over 270 all around the world. Okay. Uh, just a few years ago, we didn't even know what a Dream Center was. We'd <laughs> never even heard of it before. Okay. Uh, we, we have just a, a personal crazy story in how we even got to Colorado City. We're originally from San Diego. Right. I don't do cold. I just put that out there just so everybody knows. Uh, but it was uh, about five, six, well, six years ago now that we really felt God laying on our hearts to sell everything we owned, pull our daughter out of school right before she was starting high school and go on the road and live in our RV and do volunteer missionary work wherever God called us around the country. Wow. Everybody thought we were crazy. Right. I mean, my, my father-in-law is a pastor and he was even, are you guys having money problems? Are, are you guys losing the house? You know, what's wrong? Everybody thought that there was something wrong with us. We had our own businesses. Our daughter had been in the same private Christian school her whole life nothing wrong. We should not be doing this crazy thing. Yeah, yeah. Nonetheless, we really felt that God had laid in our hearts to, to do this. And so uh, we, we did. We, we packed up everything, sold our house, both businesses, said goodbye to everybody and pulled our daughter out of school, put her in a private online Christian school. And we hit the road, not knowing where God wanted us to go. We knew wow. he wanted us to go, but he hadn't revealed to us where. I gotta, I gotta say, we're very Type A personality, so yeah. not knowing where we were going was was a real huge step of faith for us. Oh because, wow! Yes. Because okay. Because everything we'd planned out, we both owned our own businesses. We were very, we were very organized. We were, oh, knew what we were doing, and and it really was a step that you know, as we pulled away, we we're like, uh, yeah, I don't know where we're going. Uh, we're, we're first. Were you just we, reading in Genesis <clears throat> one day in the call of Abraham and said, <laughs> I guess this applies to us? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it was. Um, it's always a number thing. It's a long story, but the short version is really. Um, I ran across this this uh, thing. When does faith become foolishness? Yeah. yeah. And and as, as I looked at what we had to do and what we had to go and sell the house and move out and our daughter and all the rest. And so we we kind of we fleeced it out. We called it. You know, where we put the fleece out of, outside the tent. I said, Lord, you know, if this is really you, if you're really asking us to do this, then these things need to happen. And it was selling the house, selling the business, selling the vehicles, all these. Getting uh, our daughter on board, on the board. teenage daughter. Oh it's one thing to have a man yeah. and wife on the same page at the same time, yeah. which is pretty. That's pretty extraordinary. And but you know, you get a. Uh, she was what. 14 maybe at the time yeah. right um that's remarkable so it's remarkable right yeah. and to move into a motor home which is 200 square feet with her parents uh yeah that, that, that's truly a miracle but so you know when does faith become foolishness and for us you know the answer came really clearly with uh, the scripture of when peter got out and walked on water with jesus yeah. and you know faith is never foolishness when you know god is telling you to go yeah and yeah. and and that for us was it is is when you know when god says come you're better with him no matter where it is, yeah. wind in the waves, walking on the water, than you are just living in a safe, safe, you know, home yeah. environment or, or, you know, living the suburban lifestyle. So, you know, it was a huge step of faith for us, but we, we, we knew he had something planned. We just didn't know. Yeah. We didn't get to yeah. know what it was. Yeah. It was a need to know basis. Yeah. I, I want to tell our viewers, um, I've only met this couple uh, three weeks ago, and I just met Jenna today. 
and the admiration that I have for them and the work that God has called them to do is is so high because of this very passion that you just shared and your willingness to kind of throw caution to the wind and say, God, if you'll lead us, we'll follow. Amen. And Amen. so many American Amen. Christians need to hear that kind of message because it's very easy to live a comfortable Christian life in a comfortable Christian community and really not have very much demanded of you in, in our world today. I mean, it's very easy to dance with the world these days and, and, and be Christian, but but not really focused on that as much. Mm-hmm. And I, I think under the current set of circumstances where our world is being shaken a little bit by this mm-hmm. virus, That's I true. think a lot of us are at least pros- you know, uh, thinking through the possibility that maybe Maybe our focus, maybe our devotion, maybe our commitment to Jesus is not where it needs to be, and maybe it'd be a good time to let this world condition. I, I heard a, a pastor say just yesterday, you know, I, I'm a man of faithful devotion to the Word. I, I read the Bible every day. I pray every day. But in this new normal situation that I'm dealing with, I'm spending a lot more time with the Lord. And I basically, the, the big revelation to me is that what I thought was deep Bible study and deep prayer was not. Amen, yeah. And now and now I'm experiencing what I did not get did not really have and how deep his walk with God is growing and I'm I'm so grateful for stories like that. So I'm grateful for your story and your willingness to to do this crazy thing. So you got in a in a in a RV and went where? <laughs> so we, well, that's the funny part. We literally got in the car and and pulled away from our little neighborhood and said, "Uh, where do we go now?" We had no idea where That's God was calling us. That's amazing. So the only thing we could think of is that we got married on Lake Powell, which is about two hour and a half hours from here, from us. Uh, and we just fell in love there. It was a place that we really felt like God spoke to us, and he showed up every time we were there. And so we thought, okay, if we're going to go somewhere and wait for God to talk to us, it's going to be here because we know we can yeah. find him here. Yeah. So we, we drove right to, to Lake Powell, and when we were there the very first weekend, we looked up a little church to go to, and it had a youth group, and that's why we picked it. And that first weekend, the pastor gets up and does the announcements first. Okay. The very first announcement was that they were doing a back-to-school backpack school drive to the kids in Colorado city that following weekend so when the service was over the three of us had not talked to each other at all and glenn gets up and makes a beeline for the pastor i'm behind (laughs) him pulling on a shirt going honey we got to do that back to school you know outreach and Haley, our our daughter is behind me going mommy we got to do that back to school backpack and glenn's like i know i know that's what we're going to go talk to him about so we get up there completely bowl him over hi we're the joneses we were really excited we just want to help these kids we want to go on this outreach what what can we do and i remember the pastor actually took a step back from us and he's like who are you people right because we just completely absorbed him now you have to remember that from san diego which is where we're we're from to get to lake powell we had to drive through colorado city so for years we were driving through this stretch of road and it was always ooh creepy town don't stop wonder which one's worn jeff's house look for the prairie dresses i wonder if you can see the child brides because we had followed all of the news media stories sure it had been a part of our story driving through here for so many years. And so when we had that opportunity, it just made sense. And at that point, it was more out of curiosity sure. because we had driven past it and never driven into the town. Right. So the following weekend, we went out with the church and it was just a half day uh, outreach that we did. And when we were there, we brought 65 backpacks that first time and they were gone within the first like 20 minutes. There was just kids, hordes of kids just coming in and coming in and coming in, hardly any adults. Uh, ill-fitting clothes, no shoes on, filthy, dirty, live lice in their hair, and just coming out of the woodworks. And I remember looking around going, where are we? It felt like I'd stepped into a third world country with all of these kids. And as we were cleaning up that day, I was sweeping, and there was one little girl about kindergarten age, and she still had her little prairie dress on. Her family was transitioning out of the church. And uh, she looked up at me and she said, are you just going to leave like everybody else does? Wow. And I looked down at her, and before my brain could even register what I was saying, I said, no. And I promised this little girl I wasn't going to leave her. And so then on the way back to Lake Powell, I had to explain to my husband and my daughter that I just promised this little girl I wasn't going to leave her. And luckily, God had been working on their hearts. And they said, yeah, we were kind of feeling something there, too. So we literally packed up our RV, plopped it in the middle of the town. And we're like, "Okay, Lord, I I don't know why we're here. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do. The middle of this community. The middle of Colorado City. About six years ago. This uh, was about, about five years. Yeah, okay. Okay. So four a, and a half. There, yeah. there was a there was a, 
uh, a time period there where we went and worked to disaster relief for Samaritan's Purse. Okay, okay. Um, and you know what's amazing about that part of the story? It doesn't have much to do with Colorado City, but it was God preparing us for what we would be okay, doing here. Okay. You know, we ran our own businesses at, at our home in San Diego, but as we went out to work for Samaritan's Purse doing disaster relief, so hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, you you name it, yeah. we would do things for them. We became team leads with Samaritan's Purse. Okay. And our, our team of choice was always the kids. We would always say, hey, give us the high school groups, give us the college groups, because nobody else wanted those. And so we're kind of working our way up through the ranks of Samaritan's Purse, so we would take those kids on. But what we realized is, is God was used, was teaching us how to run mission teams, how to handle, you know, projects. But, you know, I always said, give me, a, a, you know, 50 high schoolers, because I'll take a house right off its foundation faster than a skid steer and a tractor. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was, we were very, it was very powerful. But God yeah. used that time to te- train us, to teach us, to learn how to be able to be not just a run a, a disaster relief team, but how to teach kids about discipleship and yeah. what was being a mission trip plan and look for mission opportunities and ministry opportunities, things like that. So not knowing we were coming here yeah. but yeah. and run mission teams here, but that's that, that was really all the piece. So. so you can imagine when we show up in town and we've got California license plates and a Christian bumper sticker and one wife and one child and here's our RV plopped and we still got like a sore thumb right. in the community. Yeah. And it was amazing that every day we prayed for opportunity to meet somebody, to know somebody, to get to hear their story. And it just pierced our hearts like something fierce. I mean, we would stay up until four o'clock in the morning in the RV. I'd be on my laptop. He's across from me on his laptop. And, and we're dueling, you know, history on the community and, and dueling people's stories and trying to get to the real root of it. Because all we knew yeah. was media, Yeah, what the media had fed us. You, you had a, a kind of a peripheral knowledge and you were really getting a first rate, like original source, first source kind of stuff. So obviously uh, we, we have to fast forward a little bit here. Yeah. So you, you make a decision to come here. How then do you get this place that we're sitting in right now, which is called the Dream Center, and it used to belong to Warren Jeffs. You both want to tell this part of the yeah, story. Yeah, we're going to fight over the microphone <laughs> to tell <laughs> the, the, the story. Because sure. we are literally sitting in a building right now that used to belong sure, to Warren, Warren Jeffs, Jeffs, the yeah. man who's in prison, the yeah. man who used to lead this organization. This was his primary residence. I think it's 29,000 square feet. Correct. Yeah. I think there's 44, four, 44, 44 bedrooms, bedrooms, 53 yeah. bathrooms or yeah, something 52, like that. 53 bathrooms. Yeah. And we're sitting in this in this room that is a formerly a prayer room that the family used or the families used. Um, how did this become a dream center? Yeah. So um, in the, because we lived in an RV in the winter time, we would leave Colorado city and we'd go and do work for Samaritan's purse again. So it gets really cold here. Obviously it gets snow and we lived in particle boards. So it was really kind of hard for it for I the, to, snow. yeah, <laughs> it was hard for the, it was hard to keep up with the snow. The pipes would freeze all the rest. So, so about, you know, as soon as the first snow would fall, we would split and head South and would kind of wait for the disaster and then go and serve with Samaritan's purse. So um, as it uh, would happen and, and really we're just following God's call, we were just going from place to place to place. We were in Baton Rouge and then we were in, uh, Mississippi, and then we ended up in Louisiana. Louisiana had had a tornado that had blown through, uh, right in New Orleans. Uh, like an F three had blown through town, so they they called us up and said, "Hey, can you come down? We need people. We need." Uh, was that people. Katrina? Uh, no, it was bef- no, it was much after Katrina. Okay, yeah, okay. it was just a, it was just a just yeah. kind of a random tornado that had blown through the east part of New Orleans. Okay, um, and they called us up, asked us, to, so we you know packed up the trailer and went from our last deployment right and you know, took like a couple day break and then right into the next deployment. Um, with Samaritan's Purse, which is just an amazing organization, I can yeah. say. That's just top, top notch, what the, that, those folks do and how hard they work. But um, so we ended up in New Orleans and uh, we were running a couple of different teams, cleaning up uh, people's yards. Um, roofs were blown off. And there was one particular day we were um, just just uh, working in, uh, I think it was Miss Shirley's yard. A uh, roof had blown off from her neighbor's house. So there's just a mess in her backyard. So we, you know, we're running this team of 20 people or so. And uh, there's a kid that I'm talking to. And, you know, you, as you do you know, in small talk, he says, well, where are you from? And we said, well, we're from this place called uh, Colorado City. Um, and he just flipped. He said, oh, God's been calling me. I got to go to Colorado City. I'm really excited to go to Colorado City. So we talked and talked and talked, because that's what you do when you're raking up somebody's lawn. And I said, well, listen, you know, we, you know we're here for the wintertime, but when the, when the spring comes, we'll come back and, and meet you. Where, are you. where are you? And he goes, I'm in Phoenix. Come back through Phoenix and meet him in Phoenix. I work at this place called the Dream Center. You got to come see the Dream Center. And right away, kind of my I was like, the what center? You know, what, you, you know, what are you into? What, what do you, yeah. what, what, maybe some kind of craziness, the dream center? <laughs> what do you study dreams? 
Anyways, I so I, you know, I patronized him. Said, sure, sure, sure. You know, a few months, we'll we'll uh, come by and see you. Long story short, we you know fast forward. We come back through Phoenix. We look this kid up and said, hey, can we come see you and let's come see this Dream Center place. Um, he says, well, yeah, go take the tour at the Dream Center. I, tr- I called the Dream Center, try to get a free tour uh, or just a tour of the facility, trying to like a private tour. They wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. This, you got to take the public tour. So we go and we take this public tour of, of the Phoenix Dream Center. Amazing facility. Truly God working in the facility, but it's an inner city ministry. So you have people with tattoos, you have uh, prostitution, human trafficking. Um, you know, we, we were blown away by it and we felt God moving, but you know, they sit you, they give you a lunch when you're all done with it, with the tour and we sit down and, and I'm having lunch and uh, I'm looking across the table at this guy and he's covered in tattoos, tattoos down his neck, t- on his face, on his hands. And I'm like, what? I don't have anything in common with you. But I, God was doing something with me. And it was kind of one of those moments when we left the Dream Center that day. We actually sat in the parking lot and we prayed and we said, we, I was a little upset with God because there was something happening. He was, I felt like he was calling us to the Dream Center. But we didn't know what this was. And, and I was like, God, we're in Colorado City. That's where you want us to serve. We, we know it. We feel it. What, what is going on with this? You know, and, and you get that moment when you're a little we, upset we with God. We told the little girl we were staying, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we were a little upset with God. Like, what's going on? And so, we, you know, we just prayed for it, and we, we packed our things up, and we left. And we left, we, you know, we left the Dream Center and came back up here. Okay. Um, I'll let Jenna tell this part because it actually involves her. Come back up here. Okay. So when we get back, a, a friend of ours in town had asked me to host a bridal shower for a woman in town I'd never met before. Okay. So I said, sure. So I, I come and do this bridal shower. So she'd been married before, and it was her choosing of a man this time. And so oh. she wanted to go through the yeah. normal traditions that okay. she sees women do. Right. So I host this bridal shower. Turns out it was Warren Jeff's 65th wife, Brielle Decker. And so we, st- we hit it off. And she, she has left that marriage? She, she left Warren Jeff's marriage, okay, and she yeah, was remarrying. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So she was getting remarried uh, to a man of her choosing. And in the bridal shower, she just struck up a conversation with me, and, and we hit it off. And, and she says, so I want you to come see my house. And I thought, oh, oh boy, you know, the, the houses are, are quite run down here. Um, they're really, you know, disheveled. And, and, and she said, I just got this house. I'd like you to come see it. And I said, okay. She goes, no, no, it's Warren Jeff's house. And I went, okay, that's cool. So I'm texting Glenn under the table at the bridal shower. We get to go see Warren Jeff's house because it was really Cause, cool. Because you knew this house, right? But you had never been in it. We no, didn't even in, know, yeah. But you knew we, what, that it was his house because you'd been here serving, ministering. Yep, yeah. yep. It so, was all boarded up. It was all gated couldn't off. Couldn't even see it. You couldn't oh, get in okay. to see it. Yeah. Okay. So we knew of it, but we'd never right. yeah, yeah. had that. So, so she um, takes us on the tour of this house, and she had just gotten possession of it, so she had the rights to the house if she could do something with it. And so she's showing us around. Now, keep in mind, there was no electricity on during this time. The people who were in here had just left, so it was quite creepy. I mean, we're, we're seeing it in the early stages here, and it we're walking around. It was as it was before. Empty, yeah. Yeah. Empty, yes. A few yeah. beds, a few mattresses just strewn around. Yeah. Dark. You had to use your you know, flashlight from your phone to yeah. walk wow. through here. Yeah. Um, creepy. Uh, you, you know, just, yeah. just a yeah. creepy The right vibe. word for it. It, yeah. was, it was quite creepy walking around. But it was interesting, <clears throat> though, because the whole time we're walking through, I'm pulling on a shirt going, wouldn't this be a great dream center? Oh we had just seen the dream center. <laughs> and so you see these, these you rooms see the that have these baby suites on them, and you think, wow, that'd be great for, for these women <laughs> yeah. coming out of, you know, difficult situations. Yeah. And so at the end of the tour, I asked her, I said, what are you going to do with this big house, you know, all by yourself? And, and she said, I'd like to make it a, a healing center for women and children. And I thought, well, that's great. I said, like the Dream Center. And she said, what's that? So we, we told her briefly. And she goes, yeah, something like that. End of conversation. That was it. Okay. So we had become friends in this time period. And she was spending a lot of time up in Salt Lake and trying to get ready for her wedding. And so she needed somebody to kind of keep, look after the house. So we agreed to be the caretakers. Glenn was over here watering the house and watering the yard and checking on things every night, coming over and taking care of it. And so... A couple of weeks later, fast forward, the guy that we met in New Orleans that okay. was told us about the Phoenix Dream Center drives up here. Okay. And so we had access to the property because we were taking care of it. And, and we were showing you know, different people that came into town, the house, and we took them on a tour. And so he does the same thing. He comes in. He's like, dude, wouldn't this be a great dream center? And he's all excited about it. And, and so as we're walking through, he's like, okay, I want to get pictures and I want to get video of you giving the tour of this because I'm going to go show everybody to, down in Phoenix because this needs to be a dream center. And we're like, okay, we laughed about it. Wow. It was a joke. He was the night volunteer security guard at the Phoenix Dream Center, and he wasn't even anymore. At that point, he wasn't even the volunteer oh anymore. Goodness. We had taken the public tour. We walked through laughing 
that that was even a possibility. There was nobody. There was no connection there. We didn't no. know anybody there. It, it, it was it was kind of one of those joke dreams that oh maybe this could be a dream center one day. Uh, yeah, it'll never happen. It's yeah. a great idea, but you know that's not that's we not. Laughed. And and yeah. this is just a, a classic moment again for all of us to be inspired by. Um, the idea that be careful what you joke about Absolutely. because God might just say it's not a joke to me at all. Yeah. This is what I've called you here to do. God was using yes. you, God was using his name was Ryan. God was using Ryan who was just being obedient and following God's path. He was using us who were technically homeless at that moment because we were living in an RV, homeless traveling homeless. around, going wherever God told us to go. All these pieces of the puzzle all together. It wasn't what we did or what Ryan did or as you'll hear the rest of the story. God was using individuals just being faithful and obeying his commands Amen. and to put this together. I, I want to make this comment because there, there's no doubt in my mind, in my own life and other examples that I can think of, that God could have done this with somebody other than the Joneses. But the mere fact that you set off from San Diego years before this all comes to, to you know, at least a couple years before yeah. this all comes to fruition, and what God knew was going to take place and the the step-by-step -step procedure that he had yet not revealed to you but was going to reveal to you in part little by little by little to bring about this amazing new thing now— I mean, when you look back hindsight, you see God absolutely in every step of the process. Absolutely. But going through the process, you didn't see God at all. Yeah. Absolutely. Probably, you, yeah. absolutely. You know, a little bit yeah. by little bit, maybe yeah. you did. But so many of us want to say, God, I'm ready to serve you. And just tell me what you want me to do, and then I'll serve you. But I'm not going to really do much until I know exactly what you want me to do. But you threw your bread upon the water, and it came back in, in the form of, this yeah. is what I want you to do. And that that's the testimony, folks, that Absolutely. we just need to celebrate and get inspired by. And maybe somebody needs to hear it very personally in their own lives yeah. that it's time for you to uh, venture out in a way that uh, doesn't seem reasonable, doesn't seem uh, judicial, you know, maybe that will cause some people to think you're being a little odd or strange, but it's something that you know God wants you to do and you do it. And then you'll find out what it is that God has in store for you. And it'll probably be a pretty cool thing. Yeah. We, we always I, say that, you know, God, uh, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the yeah, call. Amen. And, amen. and for, you know, for us, none of us had any vision of what this is what we wanted to do. We didn't have training in this. Ryan was, like I said, just the night volunteer security guard. So all those pieces of the puzzle, you know, God can use it. God can use anybody. You know, we say this, we love this story to tell to our high school kids and college kids that come. You never know how God's going to use uh, you yeah. by just going and volunteering and raking somebody's lawn in New Orleans, Louisiana, and it puts together to, that makes this happen. Phenomenal. Yeah. Keep going. So uh, when, once he did the video and the pictures, he went back down to Phoenix and, and showed it to everybody, even people who wouldn't listen to him. I mean, there was the pastor of the church down there that supports the Dream Centers, and he tried to corner the pastor going into the green room, and the pastor's like, all right, you got five minutes and you've already used two of them. What, what's going on here? And tried to tell him the story. He's like, great, great, great dream. Good job. You, you keep going with that. And, and everyone just patronized him yeah. and nobody took him seriously. But for some reason, the pictures and the videos got passed around to everybody in Phoenix. And a couple weeks later, we get a call on his cell phone and we hear this, hi, this is Brian Steele. I'm the executive director of the Phoenix Dream Center. And I heard you have a property up there that might make a great dream center. We're in the truck yeah. heading to St. George for supplies. I'm sitting next to him. It's over the, the speaker in the truck and I'm Googling it because I think I'm getting punked. Like the, there's no way the, the head of Phoenix Dream Center is calling us right now. So I'm actually Googling his name and he's talking to him on the phone and I turn my phone, I go, it's really him, it's really him, it's really him. We didn't know who he was at the yeah, time, but it was him. But it sounded official. It sounded know. official. And so he sent up some scouts and, and literally four months later, we had the building as the Dream Center. The Dream Center network secured this property, and, and there wasn't a, no, a, a doubt in our mind that it wasn't God that was doing it because all along, the, the deal kept dying, and, mm -hmm. and the director down there kept putting it in the Lazarus file. He said, only God can resurrect this because right. the deal just kept falling. Yeah. And every time, God kept bringing it back and bringing it back and bringing and it back. And obviously, the... the the young lady that you mentioned that uh, owned the property, she she had to buy into this idea and and agree to it, right? I mean, and and, and she did that rather easily. I mean, that was That's, that was it what was, her original vision yeah, was is to make it. Dream. Yeah, it's fulfilling yeah. her dream. Yeah. You know, it's amazing because we tell this story, and and you know, when you look back at it, we're talking about this looking back. You know, when uh, when she originally got the paperwork, so it's kind of a long story, but in the short version of how she got it is she had paid into the trust. The whole town was controlled by a trust, um, and so she had she had a she had the right to have that 
some of that money returned to her. The trust doesn't have money, so they would give property. So that's kind of how she had the rights to buy this house. But it wasn't enough money, so she had about half of the value of the house. So the Dream Center would have to come up with the other half of the value of the house. So, um, anyways, but what you know, when she originally applied to get this house and to make it a house of healing, they they, need, they asked her to put a name on the project. What are you going to call this? And so she just had to kind of come up with a name as she's filling out the application. She goes, I don't know, call it the Dream House. Oh my goodness! But a year before, this was a year before we met her. Yeah. This is a year before the building existed. A year before, you know, we had just been on the road. Brian Steele, the Dream Center, Ryan, all none of these connections happened, and she yeah. just came up with this name, calling it a Dream Center, Dream the Dream, 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 Dream House. Dream House. Wow! Yeah. Wow! So, again, fast forward. You take over this property. The money is all provided, or however that is worked out. But this place is not in good shape, is it? I mean, when you take it over, I mean, is it? Pretty, I mean, you talked about the electricity being off and kind of being creepy. Was it, was, what, what did you have to do to turn this into a place that could really house people and, and begin to serve people? So one of the biggest things is because it was the, the prophet's house, it wasn't really damaged. It wasn't in a lot of disrepair. Okay. The biggest thing for us is that it was very hospital white walls. Um, it was a lot of triggers for people. So okay. sometimes just the carpet patterns would trigger people. Um, there was just a, a lot of past in this house. Sure. And so one of the big things that we want to do is remove some of those triggers and, okay. and make it inviting and make it warm but when we're looking at 44 bedrooms and we're looking at the fact that we're a nonprofit and any money comes in is from private donors we're not going to use the money that comes in from private donors to decorate pretty rooms we're going to serve the people and we're going to help and provide resources and tools right, to them right. so I, I put it up one day on facebook as adopt a room and oh, I said, goodness. here's a picture of this sad little room with carpet up the walls and, you know, hospital white walls. And here's what it could look like. And I, I took something off of you know, Google and put it next to each other and said, would you like to adopt one of the rooms at, at the Short Creek Dream Center? And this is right as we were first starting out. That is how we got all 44 bedrooms completely remodeled is from people all across the country calling me all different denominations, walks of life, beliefs. I had people calling me saying, I don't believe in anything. I'm an atheist, but I believe in what you're doing there. Yeah. It, it's just it's been remarkable. amazing. I mean, to think of that, and each doorway has a little plaque or a little yeah. marker that identifies who did that, and either some inspirational statement or a Bible verse or the name of the person, and it really goes as a testimony again that in a, in a very broad way and, and a fairly quick way it appears i don't know how long it took to, to decorate these rooms but you know you've only been at this for about five years and this place is really quite impressive in many ways the rooms are beautiful okay. um the different facilities that you have a chapel here mm -hmm. you have a, a, a service a, a major kitchen here you can provide a meal for a large number of people you have all kinds of programming here that are going on for the different moms who come here and with their kids many times mm -hmm. so so I know we're kind of moving into that third block there, this whole idea of, of how is God using this place now? What's, what's happening here? What's the story? So one of the first things is my favorite compliment from the community is somebody from the community that grew up here that knew what this house was. When they come back and they visit us, they walk through the door and their very first reaction is, oh, it just doesn't feel the same anymore. And they would say, I wow. can't put my finger on it, but it just feels happy. And, and we know exactly what that is. We know it's love. We know it's, we have Christian music going through the hallways all the time. We have fun in here. We've got the Holy Spirit in here. I mean, there's just, and the remodeling. I mean, all these yeah. different things contribute to the fact that it feels different for them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first point because sometimes people come through here and they need to walk through just for healing, yeah. just to move past that. And to see that it doesn't look anything like what it did before is, is step number one. And that's wow. actually something that we we didn't come into it saying that's going to be part of our program it's happened as we've done this transformation and as we've done this process because yeah. the communities watched us take on this transformation yeah. of the house we put it on facebook we put it up there and so it's fascinating for them as they are going through transformation in their lives right. to watch a physical building under transformation it's very fitting and very healing for them so that was the first thing i just want to ask a quick question because i and i'm sure it's not the case but just because someone else might ask this, like, 
would anybody be angry that you're here, that you're doing what you're doing to this building, that you're using it in this way? Would the community mostly support you, or would there be any danger from the community or people that would be very angry at you guys for doing this? So, you know, in God's perfect plan, yeah. you know, he had us here before we took the building. So a couple of times you said we've had been here five years. We've been here five years, but the Dream Center's only been here really two and a half. Oh, yeah, two, wow. Yeah, okay. two years, okay. four months. Oh, so, so we were wow. here before That's then. Remarkable. And, and that was, you know, we continued to serve. We continued to put our RV right in the middle of town uh, and, and, uh, and, and serve. And so we were doing, you know, we'd do movie night. And we'd do, you know, paint night uh, up, uh, up at the park. We'd do uh, capture the flag, all, all these kind of games for the kids. No church organization really of, or affiliate, with, you know, with that. But, you know, we just knew that's what the community needed. So, so when you say, were you in any danger? How did the community accept it? The majority of the apostates loved what we were doing because yeah. we were there for the kids. So we were running hot dog events and uh, all, all these different, you know, I was asked to sit on the board for the 4th of July event, wow. all these different things. And so we were accepted within the community because what we would do, because we were giving of, of ourselves and giving of our time and doing all these great events for kids to give them, give them something to do during the summertime. Yeah. Well, you're, you're nailing one of our values on Building Bridges with Greg Johnson. You're nailing a value of, of our ministry in Utah, uh, Standing Together, which I provide leadership for, which is a network of evangelical churches in Utah. And we strongly, strongly, strongly believe that people don't care how much they, that you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. And so what you just shared there was a principle Absolutely. that we've talked about quite a bit on this, uh, on this channel, that you came here to love them unconditionally, serve them unconditionally, provide for them unconditionally. And then when this, this door of opportunity opened, you weren't like some out of town defiler, you know, of the property of that once belonged to their leader, but you're actually taking taking it and, and you're going to do something unique with it, something positive with it. And, and you're good people. We've seen that already. So uh, thank you. I, I think one of the biggest things is that we like to share that this is an incredible message of hope. If you take the fact that a lot of people thought that Warren Jefferson and the things that happen here and the things they've heard on the media is just the epicenter of evil, and, and you take that and it's transformed into something beautiful and something for healing and something that, that's good and loving and kind and, and all of those opposite yeah, things, yeah. it really gives people hope that no matter where I am, no matter what's going on in my life, no matter how bad or how dark it is, God can use this pain, God can use this time yeah. and really transform it into something beautiful. Yeah. And it's an amazing message of, of hope to be able to, yeah. to share with people. And hope is transformational. Yes. Hope will change people. People who don't believe there's a chance of anything ever changing or anything ever being different. I'm, I'm trapped into this life. I'm yeah. trapped into the circumstance. There's no way out. We can begin little by little as they see one person reach out for help. As one person comes to your food bank that that opens up a door and like, wow, these people really do give you free good food and, and they're, it's a wonderful thing and they're so nice and they wave to you every time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I tell them that they are the mayors of uh, this city, whether or not they are the elected officials or, or, or you know, whatever title that people want to give you, but you're waving there like you're running for election, you know, how are you doing folks? And everybody knows you and smiles back and waves back. So, I mean, it, again, it's very, very much, you guys are a phenomenal illustration in my book, in my understanding of missional uh, outreach, missional love, where you're building these bridges, you're finding common ground, you're removing the rhetoric, you're bringing the walls down through the, the love and service. And, and then the gospel has a very easy way of being yes. shared. It's been lived out already. Now, at the moment when they're ready, that they ask a question. You told me earlier that when that moment happens, that's priority number one for you drop guys. Everything. We mm -hmm. drop everything and we say, what did you just say? Or what are you, yeah. what are you asking? As I like, to pay, I like to tell people, I say, uh, you know, Jesus is the answer. What's the question? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the big things for us is many times people have seen God in action. Many people have heard about God's love, yeah, but not many people have seen it in action. Right, right. So can we be that hands and feet? Can we be here to show them that love first that does bring that, that bond and that relationship, and that trust to, to open those questions? Yeah. So some of the things that, that we do here to be able to, to help build those relationships and that trust, as you were mentioning some of the rooms that we have here, we also have a sensory room, which was really important to us because there are a lot of um, people with, struggling with autism or on the spectrum, ADD, ADHD, depression, anxiety. I mean, you, you name it, it's yeah, here yeah. to be able to have 
have a room that has the textile and the tactile and the play therapy sand and bubble wrap and weighted blankets and a bubble tube wall that is calming for them, that can help wow. them, that our counselors can use was really, really important for us. We have an art therapy room. Because uh, one of the things that we found that the, the people here are so incredibly gifted and some of the big things are music and art. Mm -hmm. And so through art therapy, a lot of times you can really heal through that yeah, without yeah. having to see a traditional counselor or having to do something that makes them uncomfortable. Right, right. So that was another really important key for us. And then having this whole library that we're sitting in right now to be able to do GED, to be able to do remedial education, to be able to do um, summer school program and reading program and after school program and community events here and family nights and movie nights. I mean, this room is always yeah. packed and the, the, there's no limit to what we can do through this building. Right. And it's fantastic because, you know, Tommy Barnett, who founded the, the church that has founded the Dream Centers originally, his motto was find a need and fill it, find a hurt and heal it. Yeah. And, and that's what we've adopted. It's on the back of all of our shirts. And yeah. that's really what we feel. And that's yeah. what we say to this community. And there's no shortage of need. And there's yeah. no shortage of hurt. And we're going to do everything we can to, to find those needs and to fill them and yeah. to help with that healing and to continue with their transformation. And we're down here this weekend while the coronavirus is in full force. And you just served nearly 1,000 people, I think, today. 1,000 people. Uh, mm -hmm. with, with first rate, beautiful food baskets and baskets of food that you brought to their cars because they have to they have to drive in they can't go through the yeah. normal selection process during this season as you're being very careful about the health issues and mm -hmm. sanitation and all that and one after another car after car after car coming and going coming and going filled with food filled with with uh, food to take home to their families or multiple families really um, is really an amazing example you've acquired again I, I think a property just across the way from here yeah. another building another home that can be kind of what Dream Center point 2.0 kind of thing or uh, an expansion yeah. of the yes. <laughs> of the yeah. thing and and you have other pieces of property you have other you know like where your staff lives and yep. and you're you're it's amazing so I, I know you have absolutely zero needs but let's just talk about possible <laughs> needs in case anybody was watching this who said how can I either help or how can I get involved or you know is there any opportunity to come and check it out or s serve in a short-term capacity or a longer-term capacity. What are some of the opportunities? We'll, we'll end on that. What are some of the opportunities or needs you, you might offer to people who might want to say, hey, how can I get, connect with the Dream Center there in Hilldale? Sure. I'll start with... Um you know, it's not it's not the most exciting need. And people sometimes look at this and go, oh, a tremendously huge organization. You got trucks, you got vans. Um, but, you know, one of our, our biggest battles is just the overhead expenses. And and so you look at it and say, oh, my gosh, it must be enormous. But, you know, a, a, a drop here, a drop there, a drop there, a drop, that's what really makes up the difference. And so individual donors, individuals that just give a little bit of money really does make up a difference. Like, it's it's easy for us to maybe go to a corporation or go to, um, you know, a, a big church or something like that and say, boy, we really need a van to be able to deliver food to, like we just did a little bit ago. We need yeah. a refrigerated van. We got one donated to us. And, and they'll buy that for us. But to say we need money for the electric bill yeah, is just yeah. not the pretty and the exciting one. But it's, it's, the, it's the type of thing that individuals can do. I can't underestimate the power of prayer. I tell you, you know, for us, being here, the hedge of protection, you know, you asked if we were ever in danger or anything like that. You know, we know that, that, that God has given us a hedge of protection and gave it to us because of the amount of people that were praying for us. You know, my dad's church back in, in, uh, in San Diego, um, the people in the Phoenix Dream Center, and all over the country that had come and helped it at, this, uh, at this event. So the power of prayer is just unbelievable. So praying for us, if you can't donate, then you can pray for us. And I tell you, that makes one of the most... Uh, and the most even if you can donate, you can still pray. Pray, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Pray absolutely. first. Yes. Yeah. Then donate. <laughs> I'll add a couple more. So you mentioned the new building. We yeah. actually just closed on that two weeks ago. And so that's another 13-bedroom house that we are expanding onto. So that opens up adopter rooms all over again for people. And go. I found that that's been really exciting. Any of you love Pinterest? <laughs> This is your perfect place to actually yeah. live that out. It's it's pretty what, fantastic. What would be? Do you, would you even have a recommendation on what a cost might be to adopt a room, or what it would take to to make a a, a bland room look beautiful for 
for somebody that might be staying there? Any you know general guidelines for that? What it so might cost? So there, there are guidelines, but for cost, it, it's really up to the individual people because I don't put any limits on it. I say, look, if you want to do a girl's room, a boy's room, whatever it is, and then you get to you get to design it, you get to put it all together. So I've had some churches that are able to get everything donated and it costs them hardly anything to, to do it. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of what support system do you have around you? We knew a friend that had a furniture store and they supplied all the furniture. So all they had to do was buy paint and you know some other few knickknacks and things. So it really just kind of depends on, on what your support system looks wow. like and how you want to get people involved yeah. in it. But I leave the creativity completely open. Yeah. And the creativity of the different rooms here in this Dream Center are amazing. Yeah. And they're, they're just as unique as they can possibly be. And how one room would grab the attention of one particular woman who might be here with five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 kids, um, and how it might just be the the, the sanctuary they're looking for to stay here for a season of time to begin to heal, begin to be transformed uh, before they take a step out on their own uh, is amazing. So I, I, I think the adopt a room thing is a really cool idea that we could so, share with people. I was just going to say then my last plug or last sorry is we do have some salary uh, staff positions available. You know, it's, it's difficult because we're kind of on the edge of the world here. The Grand Canyon is just a little ways away. Uh, so, you know, as far as corner and remoteness, um, th- this is it, but we do have uh, a number of positions for, for uh, mostly females because we mostly serve female clients, but um, you know, you want to be challenged by God or maybe God's speaking to you as you're listening to this podcast. Um, I tell you, this, this is, you want to really be on the mission field without having to leave the United States. Yeah. You, no you, shots. you want to, yeah, no shots involved. Um, you you want to eat normal food. You don't have to eat. Yeah, this. right. Yeah. You're still in America. <laughs> you're still, it's a cultural <laughs> bubble, but you're still yeah, in America. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you really want to make a dent in a community for the glory of God and for the kingdom, yeah. you know, this is it. Because there's, um, you know, we haven't talked really about some of the, the trauma that's gone on and the, and the abuse that went on, but um, it's hard to fathom. It's hard to talk about through, uh, you know, even in an hour podcast of all that went uh, went on here. But, you know, if if, uh, if your heart is leading that way or you feel God's leading you that direction, we do have positions available for that type of thing. So, and yeah. like working with women and children. Yes. And yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Obviously. So so when you say that, just, just this clarification, are you needing more more single women who could come down and serve in that capacity or would you welcome married couples or yeah so with the new house we can offer uh, places to live for okay. a married couple um there's obviously a lot of, of property for rent some in in the community so they could get uh, their own place to rent or live um but you know if, if it's if it's something you feel god's calling you we, we would love yeah, to yeah. talk to them and see it yeah. and We'll we'll put some information sure. uh, at the bottom of the our contact uh, information on the screen website. there yep. so that we can get people your way either an email or a or a sure. ministry phone number. Um, but uh, we'd love to encourage you to to think about that. Uh, we we just had a group of uh, 19 college students and a professor from Westmont College uh, on the I think it was the 13th of uh, of uh, the month yeah. Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th we were here. Yeah. It was kind of one of those days, but we had. An amazing experience with these college students coming in, serving at the food bank. On You do this every Friday, every Saturday. Um, obviously, the culture shock is there where, where they see those that are, you know, wearing the prairie dresses Prairies, and living yeah. in, a, in, a, you know, in a very unique presentation of, of, of life and community. And then others, you know, that are, that, you know, you might see anywhere, any place, you know, kind of thing. And uh, the joy they had in serving here. The joy they had to participate in this unique place and unique community and unique uh, mission field that that God has brought you guys to and and, and a team of people that you have here mm-hmm. working you know and you, it probably feels like a lot of odds and ends but it's beginning to be a team a, a family literally just from literally a upper state yep. New York came yep. said hey we're we're here we're committing ourselves yep. and that's pretty amazing yep. you know to think of their story so um, you know. Final, or, or final comment, wrap-up comment uh, that you just feel kind of led to share something about uh, I think before we wrap up? For me, I, 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 it's amazing to see history in the making, uh, to see this town um, change and, and really in, put itself in a position for revival. Um, you know, we, we've always had a difficult time with the hardness of the soil here. And, you know, I can tell you, honestly, many times our prayer was, okay, Lord, can we kick the dust off our sandals and move on? Because this is, this is some tough, this is some, a tough place. It's a little overwhelming. It's, it's, um, you know, just with the abuse. And then you talk about, you know, we see all four abuses in this town. Anywhere else in the world, you see three abuses. You see, maybe you see physical abuse, maybe you see mental abuse, and you see sexual abuse. And we see all three of these in this town. But the fourth abuse that's really unusual for this town is you see 
spiritual abuse. Yeah. And that that's really the cake on, on all of this because they, they the, the other abuses you, you did because you'd lose your salvation. Mm-hmm. And so you know it's it's tremendous to see that starting to change mm-hmm. and that perspective change of, of it. Uh, it's taken years for us to do this and I, and I can't say that we're necessarily there yet. Uh, you know I've had friends of mine that come and say, hey I, I, look I know you're a Christian and I know what you believe and um, but don't ever talk to me about God. God makes me sick. God isn't something I want to talk about. And if we can have that understanding, then we can be friends. But if we can't, then I, I don't want to be friends. And I would agree to that, and then only to walk away and come back later and go, what did I just agree to? I thought I was a missionary here. Isn't that what I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> but, but then recognizing that what I needed is to build his trust. I needed to, ha- to win his confidence. Trust is the you know, consistency over time. Yeah. Be- so, so that my life can be an example. And my witness to him becomes my life, my, my relationship with my life, what we do in this community, and how we follow through with what we said we we're going to do. And that's changed perspectives for so, so many of these people. So, so that, that's, I think, what's really incredibly exciting. You just don't, yeah. there's not many places in the world, yeah. especially not in the yeah. United States, yeah. where that still exists. Yeah. You know, Rabbi Zacharias, who's a friend of our ministry and been so supportive of this model of engagement and dialogue and conversation. We, we've we often said in Utah and Salt Lake, uh, as evangelical Christians interfacing with our Latter-day Saint friends, if, if we can stop debating and start dialoguing, if we can stop contending and start having a conversation, good things will come from that. We had an early presentation between myself and a BYU professor by the name of Robert Millett up at Utah State, and the, the audience was, it was our third presentation, and we were just new at this, and, and we ended up, we would go on and to do about 65 of them all around the country, and, uh, but at this third event up at Utah State in Logan, uh, the, the, the auditorium was packed to the gills. We, we just didn't know where these students had come from or why they had come. They didn't know me. They didn't know him. Uh, we were sponsored by an organization on campus, but they were just everywhere. And then somebody handed us a copy of the newspaper, the student newspaper, and it said, come and hear a Mormon and an evangelical in conversion. Mm-hmm. And so we, we joked and said that they must be here thinking that either I'm going to convert you or you're going to convert me. <laughs> but it, it was supposed to be in conversation, not in conversion. So the intrigue oh, of who's, who's baptizing who, you know, yeah. because that's how we think of it as a, as a we win, you lose kind of a model. Yeah. And it's crazy because I would like to contend that your mission and your ministry here is not that you win and the community that lives here loses, that you beat them, that you're mm-hmm. you're the conqueror, you know, or vice versa in an evangelical Latter-day Saint relationship. But what we say is, hey, if there's a loving God in heaven, he wants us all to discover who he is. Mm-hmm. And you have a perspective and I have a perspective. And perhaps we should show a little holy envy mm-hmm. of one another and say, hey, maybe there's something I can learn from you. Maybe something you can learn from me. Mm-hmm. And as we pursue together God, however we understand him, we can honestly believe through a promise in the Bible that if you seek him, you'll find him. If you knock, he'll open. Mm-hmm. If you ask, he'll answer. Mm-hmm. And I leave all of that in God's hands. And I say, hey, I, I, I know that all I'm supposed to do is plant and water. Mm-hmm. I have never won anybody to Jesus. I have never, uh, I have never you know, convinced somebody to mm-hmm. become a follower of Christ. But I want to be somebody who will plant and water and leave the results to the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and Amen. give him all the credit and all the glory. Yes. And I think... Yeah. When we do that, then people don't become projects. They just are people that you love. Mm -hmm. And you know God loves them a whole lot more than you love them. And if he wants to use you to help show them his love, that's that's the privilege. That's the great privilege. So I think there's uh, there's so much more we could talk about. There's so much bigger of a story. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed our time with uh, Glenn and Jenna as they have uh, answered God's call, uh, unbeknownst to them, all along the way, uh, from leaving San Diego to heading to uh, Samaritan's Purse and doing outreach with them and then showing up in Lake Powell and coming up here and doing it seasonally and then ultimately making a friendship with the person who had the rights to this property and then beginning to catch their vision and seeing that the vision could be uh, really an amazing part of what God could do to heal such a broken, um, hurting place. And I know we're just, we're just, you know, ankle deep into this process, I'm sure. Yep. There's years to come, years of, of serving, years of loving, years of convincing people who have been betrayed and hurt and broken um, that God is real. God's love is real, and Jesus is real. And you don't have to throw out all of the concepts of spirituality because you were given maybe a presentation of who God was that that is not really a biblical concept, you know. 
So hopefully you've enjoyed our time. We went a little long today, but uh, we would ask you to uh, not only uh, you know spread the word, but uh, like and subscribe and share, um, pass it along. Uh, we know that we are seeing a, a growing audience, and uh, your support of this uh, podcast, Building Bridges with Greg Johnson, is extremely helpful. Uh, again, if you feel in any way inclined to respond to the needs here at the Dream Center, uh, contact Glenn and Jenna, and they would love to have a conversation. It just has doesn't have to be anything more than a conversation. You can just start with a conversation and see where that goes. You're not committing yourself to anything by just asking what's going on down there. Um, but you don't know, know where God might take that. So that's a pretty cool challenge and a pretty cool opportunity. So uh, this won't be the last time we talk about you guys or uh, from time to time bring up the, the needs of the, of the Dream Center. But you're, you are a, you're a real-life example, I think, of building bridges in the most God-honoring way that I can imagine. So appreciate so much what you're doing. And uh, uh, again, we appreciate any support. If you want to be committed to this podcast in a financial way or a prayerful way, uh, please let us know as well. You can contact Standing Together through our website. Um, there are some financial needs, just like there are for everything to make these things happen. So we are appreciative of uh, any support you might uh, send our way. So again, we will see you always on the first Friday of every month with this podcast, Building Bridges with Greg Johnson, and in between every Friday, a video blog where we talk about a principle related to the Building Bridges concept. So we'll see you next time on the Building Bridges with Greg Johnson podcast. Thanks for tuning in.